Congressman, thank you for coming back on the show. Let's pick up uh, where I just left off with Jason Stanley. We know Republicans uh, aren't taking the risks of Trump's rhetoric seriously. They're happy to defend him. Are Democrats, would you call the ex-president a fascist? Uh, thanks for having me, Matty. Uh, you know, I think clearly uh, Trump embodies uh, everything that is against humanity. I I've watched him since he's become president only get worse and worse and worse, and the rhetoric has gotten worse. And, you know, I think if he came into office again, you would see many fascist things happen under a second Trump administration. So I think, you know, we need to call him out. The Republicans, though, are just plain afraid. All they do is play to their base. Donald Trump is successful with the most extreme elements in that base. Therefore, uh, Donald Trump is calling all the shots. You know, I've said it before. It's not a political party, the Republicans anymore. It's a cult, a cult of a personality. Yes. And that is very dangerous. It's a cult uh, of a personality, and the personality is an incoherent, rambling, racist, fascist, and yet he's rivaling your candidate, your leader, President Joe Biden, in the polls. In fact, in some of the battleground states, uh, he's leading in the polls. Joe Biden is behind uh, in some of those key states. Uh, and then you throw in some of the third-party candidates who are running, thinking of running, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Cornell West, uh, Jill Stein declared this week for the Green Party. We know the damage she did in 2016. And maybe Joe Manchin. Things are not looking good for Joe Biden, are they? Well, you know, right now, a year out when Barack Obama was running for re-election, uh, his poll numbers were down. Uh, there were pundits said that he should drop out of the race. So there's many parallels. So I'm not as worried. I think at the end of the day, people are going to look at what we did, and especially in those first two years when we had Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate with a, a White House, uh, you know, rebuilding our nation's infrastructure, roads and bridges, water delivery systems, broadband, and so much more. The most comprehensive climate change legislation, lowering the yeah. cost of healthcare and energy. We've got a lot to talk about, but you know, right now, this is that period of time, just like it was for Barack Obama in his second term. That, but Congressman, you know, let me you know, let me jump in. I've I've made the Barack Obama comparison as well. It's a good comparison. But having said that, Barack Obama ran against Romney, not Trump, the personality cult, and he didn't have to worry about three to four independent candidates running third party. But Romney could at least appeal to someone with a portion of a brain, right? Um, Donald Trump has done nothing in four years to gain any additional support. In fact, it's, it's lost it. Places like Wisconsin, when you look at suburban Milwaukee, Waukesha County in that area, those are fiscally conservative Republicans who find Donald Trump reprehensive. And they're not necessarily going to go vote for Donald Trump again. Now, okay. maybe they'll vote for uh, one of these third-party candidates. But I think at the end of the day, they're going to see you either have a choice of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Yeah. And I think many of those folks are going to look at Donald Trump and just not be able to stomach him for four more years. Before we go to break, and we've got a lot more to talk about with you, but I do have to ask you right now about the looming government shutdown now just five days away. Yesterday, Republican Speaker Mike Johnson, the new speaker, introduced a two-tiered, laddered, continuing resolution, quote-unquote, to fund the government. Democratic Senator Chris Murphy called that approach today gimmicky, but he said he's, quote, open to what the House is talking about. Uh, there are no cuts or poison pill cuts in part of this resolution, so are you open to it as well in order to prevent a shutdown? Well, here's the problem with it. I mean, the House Republicans have proven themselves incapable of governing. Last week, we had two appropriation bills that we did hundreds of amendments to, and they couldn't pass the bills at the end of the day. There are middle schools that have student councils that are more effective, and that's probably insulting middle schoolers right now than the U.S. House representatives under Republican control. If we give multiple dates that we would actually potentially have a close down, uh, that would be a real problem. So, you know, at least... Uh, it's better than maybe what we saw uh, in some past proposals, but it's still very problematic when you have a Congress that still can't function like this Congress. Congressman, please stick around. After a quick break, I do want to discuss what's happening in Gaza with you. Don't go away. Do you know how many civilians have been killed, Mr. Prime Minister? Do you know how many civilians have been killed? Do you have an accounting of the number? I wouldn't trust the Hamas numbers when you say Gazan officials. That's Hamas officials. What's that's your number? What's ISIS your officials number? Do. It, it's lower than theirs. 
That's what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had to say about civilian casualties in Gaza on Meet the Press earlier today. According to Palestinian officials, more than 11,000 people in Gaza have been killed by Israeli forces since October the 7th, including over 4,000 children. U.S. officials now say they have growing confidence in the death toll reports from Gaza's health ministry. That's quite a shift from President Biden's very controversial public remarks last month, where he said he had no notion that the Palestinians are telling the truth about how many people are killed. Still with us is Democratic Congressman Mark Pocan from Wisconsin. He released a statement last month calling for a cessation of hostilities against civilians by all parties and for more humanitarian aid, but has not publicly supported calls for a ceasefire. Uh, Congressman, are you comfortable with Israel using US-supplied weapons and military aid to commit what the UN Human Rights Commissioner and Amnesty and Human Rights Watch have called possible war crimes in Gaza? Are you comfortable with this administration saying there are no limits on how Israel uses American weapons in Gaza? I think there's a lot more of us who are asking to put restrictions on anything that's going to go to Israel. Um, our question is, uh, right now, uh, I feel that this is a collective punishment on the Palestinian people in Gaza. Uh, this isn't about attacking Hamas. Uh, it was a horrific attack, and I think they have a right to go after Hamas. But this is not 4,500 kids um, are clearly not Hamas. A third of the buildings in northern Gaza being demolished or, or destroyed is not about uh, going specifically after Hamas. And, and that's the problem. Uh, right now, what we're seeing uh, is way too extensive by Israel, and we're trying to call it out. So many of us are saying, stop the bombing, cessation of hostility, ceasefire in common language is all the same. In official language, it's a little different. But I, I think the bottom line is uh, what's happening right now is way too aggressive on behalf of the Israelis, and we need that well to stop. You say it's about difference in language, but common language. I just want to get specific, Congressman. All of the world's major humanitarian aid groups, human rights groups, UN agencies, the UN Secretary General, the head of the WHO, the Pope, even the President of France this weekend, have all called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Why haven't you and 95% of your congressional colleagues done the same? Actually, many more have. Part of the problem is uh, there's the idea that a resolution in Congress uh, was the work the best way to go forward. Well, look, I, we just explained the clown show that I work with. There's no way a resolution is going to pass through Congress. So what we need to do is an all uh, all fronts attack. That includes funding for more humanitarian aid. I think a lot of groups missed that opportunity a few weeks ago when Joe Biden gave us a supplemental. We're right now doing a letter, uh, Alexandria Costa Cortez, Betty McCollum, and myself, uh, asking to set up the process for a ceasefire, immediate cessation of hostilities. And what's the plan? Because I don't think there's a plan uh, at all about what's the next steps are that are going to happen. And we are going to have uh, more signers than that resolution. In fact, what I've recommended to the, the organizations out there, I've heard at least 30 or 40 members say essentially a ceasefire, including language that I use. But we need to put that out there just on a single resolution that everyone knows has no chance of passing isn't the only strategy. And I think, unfortunately, for too many weeks, people have only focused yeah. on that. And I think we're trying to pivot I, I, to I, really make all of these statements. I get the point you're making, but you're a congressman who supported Medicare for All and Green New Deal, stuff that can't pass through Congress either. And you say you support those things because it's aspirational. You want to set a standard. So why not do that for a ceasefire? Why not tonight say, look, I know it's not going to get through Congress, but I would like to see a ceasefire in Gaza? Because I don't think you or I think we have two or four years to deal with this, right? This has got to be immediate. Uh, that's why we're saying immediately stop the bombing, immediately stop the cessation of hostilities. A ceasefire in official language sets up a process that eventually, two weeks or two months, you stop the bombing. That's too long. We need to stop the bombing now. And that's why we're trying to get more members to be saying that and pushing the White House to say that. But, I mean, come on, a resolution in Congress with Mike Johnson um, is probably not going to ever do the right thing. We all know that. So let's make sure that we're focusing on every possible way to make sure that no more bombs are hitting hospitals or schools or, or refugee camps. We've got less than 60 seconds left, but I have to ask, you've been attacking the pro-Israel lobby group, APAC, calling it, quote, cancerous to democracy, a GOP front group. Do you also believe it distorts the debate over Gaza on Capitol Hill? I mean, there's no pro-Palestinian version of APAC lobbying you and your colleagues, is there? Uh, no, no. I mean, so last uh, session uh, during the elections, there were two groups 
that came in and did something never before. It was cyber currency and APAC and spent millions in Democratic primaries uh, to try to distort the election. The, cyber, cyber, uh, the cryptocurrency guy uh, just got prosecuted, right? So you only have APAC left. The problem is they raise money from big Republican entities, spend it in Democratic primaries, and they're trying to scare members of Congress from having a conscience on these issues. And they need to be called out because they're really skirting campaign finance law. And it's ultimately, it's, it's Trojan horse money. It's Republican money being spent to elect certain Democrats. And at the end of the day, sometimes they don't even support the Democrats. They, they backed over 100 insurrectionists in their endorsements. Yes. So um, I'm going to push back a lot on APAC because they are exactly, if the NRA did it, we would all be up in arms. Uh, if uh, the Sacklers did it, we would be up in arms. Uh, we should be up in arms that a group like APAC is coming in and trying to make every election an auction uh, rather than a real election, spending more money than the candidates themselves. Okay. And we need to call them out for that. Congressman Mark Pocan, thank you so much for your time. Sure, thank you.